Hi, everyone, and good evening. My name is Myrie, and it is such a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be welcoming you all uh, on behalf of the Lighthouse. Um, a big welcome to everyone, uh, but especially to those of you with MECFS and to the humans who love and care for you, to all of you with chronic illnesses um, and those of you who have been let down um, either in diagnosis or in treatment by the medical establishment. We have a huge way to go, especially in this fight. Uh, and like many of you here, uh, this is a deeply personal illness uh, and it's one that has um, affected me and my family. Uh, that once I would have said, uh, stole my sister from me, uh, but I'm uh, lucky and uh, that she is emerging in small ways now. Um, and uh, so it is especially exciting to have a book out at this moment in time to uh, put a kick in the ass to our medical establishment in the UK to really start having these conversations. Um, to lead tonight's conversation, uh, we have Erin Williamson, uh, who I had the pleasure of uh, meeting first uh, in the Lighthouse Bookshop. She lives in Edinburgh and has a background in English literature and currently studies Spanish. She has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome following a diagnosis of ME in 2003 and was severely affected for 10 years. She likes to credit books with almost everything short of curing her and her face is one of our favorites in the bookshop. So it is a pleasure to have an opportunity to work with her tonight. Um, so I'm going to bring her up. Hi, Erin, thank you so much. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> um, I am going to hand over to you um, just by way uh, of background for everyone, a wee heads up that you can ask questions down below uh, in the ask a question box or put them in the chat and I will move them over. Uh, we're going to have a little break a little later on. Erin will let you know when that is and then we'll turn off our cameras and you have a few minutes to have a cup of tea, put your head down, take a break. And a wee reminder that tonight is recorded. So if at any point in time you need to dip out, that's absolutely fine. You'll be able to loop back. Feel free to leave a question in the chat and we'll get to it and then you can watch it later. So without further ado, Thank you very much and off you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome everyone to our launch of Waiting for Superman. We're joined just now by the author, Tracy White. Is Tracy here? Later we'll be speaking to two of the subjects of the book, Dr. Ron Davis and Dr. Janet Defoe. Um, Tracy is an award-winning journalist and science writer for Stanford University. Her work, which has garnered 23 writing awards, has also appeared in Salon, the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and more. She graduated from UC Berkeley and has a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern University. In Waiting for Superman, Tracy has written a wide-ranging account of MECFS, which is a condition described by Ron Davis himself as the last major disease we know nothing about. Symptoms are numerous and include muscle and joint pain, headaches, exhaustion, sensitivity to light, sound and touch, nausea and dizziness. It's a disease that affects 20 million people around the world. A quarter of them are severely affected. That means that they are housebound or bedbound. The book itself centres around the story of Whitney Dayfall, who is extremely severely affected. It follows Whitney's father, Ron, as he uncovers new possibilities for treatments and potentially a cure. And at its heart, this book is about more than cutting edge research or a race to find an answer. It's about the lens to which a parent will go to save their child's life. <laughs> Hi, Tracy. Can everyone give Tracy a, a virtual round of applause? Thank you. I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here. Um, the book was wonderful. Um, I think everyone reading it is just so delighted that it exists and how. Um, how important it is that something like this has been put together and for, especially for people with very severe ME that you have managed to center this story um, so well and include the whole of the history of ME somehow. Um, so I want to start with that, with the scope of the book and how much you cover. Um, Thank you so much. I want to ask what you remember of your first impressions. Um, you've, come on, you've come such a long way throughout the book and you know so much. What do you remember about first meeting Whitney? And also what do you remember about 
first hearing about the disease itself and, and how it affected, affected sufferers? Um, well, this started with an, a story assignment from my um, editor, magazine editor for Stanford Medicine Magazine. I'm a science writer at Stanford, like you said. Um, and the story was that Ron Davis, who has an amazing reputation as a brilliant geneticist, um, uh, had changed the course of his research to try and find a cure for ME-CFS because his son was severely ill with it. Um, so I went to Ron's house and that's the way the, the story starts. Um, I had heard about ME-CFS or, it, you know, probably it was, I'm not even sure what it was called when I first heard about it, but it was probably chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I had, in my career as a journalist, I had written about it a little bit many years ago before, and I'd also read the article by Laura Hillenbrand, um, the best-selling author of Sea Biscuit. and she, years ago she wrote A Sudden Illness. Maybe you're familiar with an amazing article about um, coming down with chronic fatigue syndrome, and I knew that she had written her books from bed um, because she was so ill, and I was always she was my hero for that. I was just so amazed that she could write these books from bed. Um, again, though, I knew that's all I knew. I and I, I, the name kept changing. I remember thinking, oh, isn't it called other things? Epstein Barr virus. Um, and I had no idea that people could get this sick with it. Um, so I, it was a um, difficult story to approach just because Whitney was so so ill and I couldn't meet him. It, it was two years before I actually met Whitney. Um, so I never met him when I wrote that magazine story. Um, and then uh, Janet did tell me about the book Osler's Web on that first day at her house by Hillary Johnson. And she, that journal, Hillary does an amazing job of researching the history of MECFS -E in the US and, and the, the tragic history of ME. So that piqued my interest. And you cover a remarkable range of patient stories in the book. Um, it must have been quite a conscious decision. You've already mentioned other other patients and how they influenced you. It seemed to give you a very complete sense of what you were, the, the disease itself and what you were covering. How much as you were writing were you just keen to get patients' experiences in there? Uh, you know, I've been a science writer for a long time. Um, and I always like to tell people stories. Um, so that's just the way I work. Um, but in this researching this disease, I really wanted to do my own research to try and understand what was going on. Uh, journalists in general are, are skeptics. Um, so I needed to talk to as many people as I could to, to make sure this was real. That was part of the the idea um and i wanted to i really wanted to write the book for people with the illness and, mm -hmm. and i hope that comes across yeah, yeah. Well, it absolutely does um, and you said you didn't meet whitney for two years um before right. you were, as you were writing the article and then the book um what was it like meeting him for the first time um i think you actually have a reading at this point mm -hmm. um, which yeah. we can go to now um whilst it's come up should I go ahead and, and go ahead and read? Yeah. yeah. So this is from chapter three, the adventure. It's on page thirty-three, and this is the first time I met Whitney. Um, he had gone into the the hospital for a minor procedure to have his uh, feeding tube replaced, which is an inserted into his abdomen and it breaks and needs to be replaced about every two or three months. Um, uh, so this first time I see him, I smile and nod and he smiles back. It's like watching the image I've created inside my mind of this young man built out of bits and pieces of stories and interviews and writings and photos come magically to life. It is easy to like him and I do like him right away. Suddenly, the once invisible patient who has no voice lifts his hands to speak. 
Whitney points to me with his index finger, then curls it down to meet his thumb, creating an O that he crosses with his left index finger, creating a Q. Question, I ask? He nods. With pleading eyes, he shows how desperate he is for me to understand, for others to understand what it's like for him lying in his bedroom day after day, year after year, sometimes lacking enough energy to lift a finger, to press the button by the side of his bed to call for help. Um, I should explain that Whitney cannot speak for people who haven't read the book, um, but he's trying to speak with his hands and his face. Growing agitated, he reaches out and grasps invisible bars in both his fists and pounds them into place, evenly spaced, two by two around his bed. Your life is a prison, I ask? He nods, his head flops back, his eyes roll up in his head, and his mouth drops open. You're like a corpse. He nods. For many, many hours of many, many days, he pinches his white skin. He's not invisible. He's all too real. What do you do while you're, you're lying in your room? Do you meditate? I ask. He shakes his head no. He doesn't have energy to meditate. He spends most of each day using what bits of energy he has to control the pain of digesting the liquid food that gets pumped into his body, traveling through his digestive system thick and slow, like cement. He sleeps very little. He has frostbite on his belly from the ice packs that manage the crippling pain through most of the day and into the night. He touches the skin on his arm again and grimaces. It hurts to be touched. He nods, then spells out A, L, O, N, E, alone, riding on one of the soft brown blankets that traveled with him in the ambulance from home. Our eyes glisten with tears. He plasters his face with a mask of fear, his mouth frozen in a silent scream, and spells out another word on the blanket, panic, P-A-N-I-C. And my breath catches as I feel a fist of, fist of panic punch into my own gut. Whitney touches the gray in his beard and shakes his head. He has lost so much time. He's missed so much. Rock bands that he might have loved. Photographs he could have taken. Stories he could have told. Elections he might have campaigned for. He's missed the deaths of loved ones and their births. He's missed romances and marriage and children. He missed his sister's wedding, wedding day. His hopes lie with his dad. He nods as he spells it out on the blanket. D-A-D, -D, dad, then he spells out H-E-R-O, hero. His dad will figure it out. <laughs> thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Um, um, that is one of the more difficult parts of the story uh, to read, um, how ill he is and what it's like when you're meeting him when he's like that. Um, and it's important to say that this is a very long time that this has been going on. Um, he's been ill and like this for six years. Um, I wanted to ask what it's like coming close to a family when they're in that kind of very desperate situation and being a witness to it. Um, how did that feel for you as a journalist, but also just as a witness? Um, well, actually, I felt very privileged that they allowed me to do this and to write the book and to be there with them at these really difficult times in their lives. And it's just a testament, testament to this family. They so want this story to be told. And Whitney also, who made such a personal sacrifice, um, that was one of the big worries when I interview him, many of these patients and Whitney in particular, is, uh, because of post-exertional malaise, um, the key, uh, symptom of this disease. If, if he pushed himself too far, he gets much sicker. And I think every time that he allowed me to interview him in the hospital, he would be uh, just wiped out for a couple of weeks afterwards. So I really appreciated that sacrifice. But it's such a, it was an honor to, to get to know this family and to learn about this disease and uh, to see, be part of their mission really to make a difference and, and to uh, find a cure and to to help other people like Whitney. And you find so many um, light moments and 
lovely depictions of them as a family. It's a very whole portrait. Um, there's their childhood, um, Whitney before he got ill as well, which I believe you had to piece together um, you know, from his Whitney sign language, from what other people were saying, um, from blogs on the internet, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in particular, so I didn't think I was gonna be able to interview Whitney at all, or even meet him when I, I wrote the magazine article, and um, it was, like I said, two years before I did actually meet him. So I had written the, uh, an extensive book proposal that, um, that got blown apart when things changed and Whitney was able to um, to speak with me because I wanted to get as much as possible from him into the into the book um, and he really wanted his story told in his own words and that that comes across in these interviews I hope how frustrated he was that he couldn't speak for himself um, but he wanted people to understand him yeah so you changed a lot when he became able to communicate with you a little bit the book changed exactly yeah. yeah i was wondering you mentioned in the passage um hero he spells out hero for his dad and waiting for superman that is that is ron that isn't there in the title um mm -hmm. the american edition is called the puzzle solver and obviously here we have waiting for superman and both the titles have a lot of significance throughout the book could you talk a little bit more about the titles the titles yeah. uh well back to the book proposal this book was called The Invisible Patient when I proposed it and sold it to the publisher's publishing house um, in the US um, and the UK. Let's see. So I had mentioned this to Whitney when I first started to communicate with him, um, and he looked concerned about it. Um, and the, let's see, I think it was like a I'd, I'd already written a draft of the book. There was already a um, cover made. If you look at the uh, the U.S. version, there's an invisible patient behind uh, the title, the puzzle solver. Um, so we, I, I, I didn't really take Whitney seriously, I guess, about how much he did not like that title. So at, at the last second, um, when I knew I could still change it, if I had to, I knew the publisher would be bad. I just wanted to make sure with it that he was gonna be okay with it. And he got really upset. I think it was the first time I was in his his bedroom, he got really upset. Um, he hated the title. Um, I didn't quite understand why, but I've learned to understand better. I think it really was a personal insult and just does not wanna be called invisible anymore. And, and even people have called this the invisible disease a lot. And and he just was done with it. So he, you know, as weak as he was, he pulled off his blankets and he took his, picked up his leg and set it down on the floor. And so he was gonna have nothing to do with the book if unless we changed the title. So that's why the title was changed. You cannot argue with Winnie. <laughs> no. Um, so the puzzle solver was the name of the magazine article and the US publishers chose that. Um, I think the, the publishers in the UK read the book and it had a greater emphasis on Whitney and Whitney's story than the magazine article did. And they wanted it the title to focus more on Whitney. Um, uh, the, the title, um, Waiting for Superman, it's, I think it's Flaming Lips um, band that wrote the song. And, and one of the times I visited Whitney in the um, hospital, he shared a playlist with me and Jen Brea, who um, is a friend and made the movie Unrest. Um, and he called it Waiting for Superman, this playlist. And that song was one of his favorites and he dedicated to his dad. So he loves the title. That is his favorite pirate title. <laughs> he says, they're so smart. Yeah. <laughs> And I listened to this a couple of times yesterday. I would encourage people to read the books as well. With them, as if they've read the book, if they're reading the books, it actually fits very beautifully. And it's very moving. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Ron. Could you please retell the story of discovering? You've got a chapter titled Rocket Man, and um, discovering his his life, uh, his life's work. Um, what uh, kind of eminent, an incredibly eminent person this is um, to be speaking to 
and, and and developing a relationship with and also his teenage exploits with creating a rocket a rocket fuel <laughs> is, is I mean, hilarious it was really really funny to read i was wondering if you could share this with the audience um sure so i think it, you had mentioned something about um when we talked before about um this being a difficult book to write, um, which it was, but there were certain areas that were so much fun to write about. And one of them was Ron's childhood. He had a difficult childhood because he was he was chronically ill and he um, had rheumatic fever and he, he was on bed rest a lot and he was weak as a child and he got teased a lot. And he also was dyslexic and was told that he was stupid. And by the time he got into college, counselors were telling him that he he um, was not college material um, but he Ron has this amazing mind obviously um, I think he thinks differently than the rest of the world maybe and that's why he's so creative and he's come up with these tools for the you know, human genome project when I talked to, to uh, Francis Collins the head of the National Institutes of Health in, in the US um, he said he was actually director of the human genome project when ron was working for it and he said when there was something really difficult to solve we would um call ron because he would create tools he was just so creative and a genius um so but ron when he was a teenager he did figure out how to have some fun he um he made rock model rockets um and he, the fun part of making the model rockets was to create the best fuels that he could so he wanted they started well, i think they started first it was kind of it was a thing back then among teenagers and they'd take a bullet and take out the gunpowder and use that for the rocket fuel and that was causing some problems explosions in his garage and the neighbors didn't like it and he wanted stronger fuel anyway so uh he started he wanted to go to the uni local university Eastern Illinois University, where he would attend later on. Um, he wanted to go, he went to the library and said, you know, can I read your journals? He wanted to read the, the, the scientific journals and they wouldn't let him. I said he was too young. So he started sneaking out at night and he'd bring his flashlight and he'd pick the lock of the library and then he'd sit within the stacks of the library and read these journals and figure out how to make the best um, rocket fuel. You can ask him about his very best rocket fuel that he made. Um, and and then at some point he started, that's where he got his interest in DNA because he was reading these serious scientific journals. Yeah. He's a very creative guy. <laughs> um, what is it like listening to him now talking about how he's working on Whitney's health and the team that he's assembled? What was it like meeting them uh, and hearing how he's discovering this disease and, and how he's trying to figure it out? Well, well, Ron will do anything for his son and, and to solve the mystery of this disease. Um, so was, I just was always blown away by what he's done and and how hard he works and he is just always thinking about the molecular processes um, that cause this disease. Um, he, yeah, the team that he he gathered within his own lab really I think care about him and, and knew the boss's son so it made it special but it was also just a fascinating mystery to solve so they really you know these scientists are so amazing they were fascinated and and, and they were extra hard and there was so little money it's a, it's a tough field to go into and risking your career definitely Ron did um, but there's an extra feeling of com camaraderie I think because because of the underlying reason of trying to get Whitney out of bed. Yeah. And you also do interview a number of different physicians who have been working in the field for a long time. And it's quite an important part, just as much as you're talking to patients and hearing about medical neglect, you're also um, giving the physicians who have been working very hard for a number of years, a lot of time to say, you know, how they found it. And I think it's right in the book. Um, one of them says uh, they didn't even use um, CFS in research grants. They wouldn't use the name. 
Um, could you say a little bit more about um, how it was talking to these these very brave researchers? Um, well, yes, it, uh, the doctors is what we're talking about. So many doctors um, see these patients and can't figure out what's wrong, can't find a cure, can't find a treatment, and just figure it must be all in your head, right? And that is still a serious problem. It's, it, there's no test within the doctor's office. So the doctors say, yes, you definitely have this. Um, so these, these doctors that have committed themselves to treating chronic illnesses often um, are so amazing because they have to take the time to listen to these patients. Um, and to read through their long files and to struggle to get paid. Um, I think you were talking about the two doctors. Well, uh, Dr. Dan Peterson at Incline Village was one of the first doctors who started researching the disease when there was an outbreak at Incline Village in um, California. He's um, it's changed his whole life. He's been he's treated thousands of people. Um, people travel from all over the world to come see him. Um, and he's been la his research has been laughed at. He's, he said at the National Institutes of Health in the early days, he heard that they were throwing darts at some of his research papers. Um, and I, I talked briefly with his wife, even he said the community uh, where they did not want this, uh, the, the news of this outbreak um, to hit the headlines because it was ruining the tourist industry was just, um, so mean, so mean, and has remained mean calling him a quack all these years. And they are they are stuck with that label for, for decades. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also you do mention you just call out sexism straight straight up um quite a lot of times in the book and uh, mention you know how this disease is predominantly women. Um it, you also go into the history of Emmy a lot and link it back to hysteria. Um, I was wondering if you could say a wee bit more about that and what it was like for some of the women that you'd come into contact with and what their stories, their stories were, um, mm -hmm. with that, how you found it. Um, yes, and in particular Nancy Klimas, who is a researcher that's been research, uh, researching this for since the in 1980s. Uh, she is a woman that cared about women's diseases and she treated a woman early on. Um, with Emmy and I think the word got out that she was treating people and, and she was just flooded with women and, and she's the one that told me really from early on this was a, a con, one of the contested diseases and there are several similar diseases where um, it's it, because it's primarily women that get the disease, it's burst off as hysteria and not taken seriously. Um, and I, I wrote about that. I worked with an editor when I was writing the book. Who, um, who he's the one that pointed out to me. You know, you do see the irony that it's taken a, a handsome young man getting severely ill with this disease to get so much attention in the media. Um, and maybe that says something about um, just the sexism surrounding yeah. me. Yeah. And it is also important um, you know, with Whitney's experience that nobody is safe. Um, just because you are a man, if you have this label, um, you will be treated badly. And even if both of your parents are PhDs who know exactly what they're talking about, yeah. they still have <laughs> dreadful experiences. Yeah. Um, they often. I just want to ask about the tone. In the last couple of years, you've been you've been on millions missing marches. Um, this foundation, Ron's foundation, has been has been up and running and having everyone so excited in, in the ME CFS community. Is there is there a change in America? Is there a change in how um, CFS ME is is seen? Um, are people feeling more hopeful? Is there anything that you're observing about the way the attitudes the attitudes to the disease are? Um, or, you know. I, I think there has been somewhat of a change and I think Ron's involvement um, all, over these years has made a difference. 
particularly within the scientific community, uh, where it is now considered a true biological disease. Um, there has been a little more money put towards funding. Um, I think at, you know, Ron's foundation and a lot of um, advocacy groups are really working to educate doctors more about the disease. Doctors aren't taught in medical school about it and, and they don't get um, insurance doesn't cover treatment, so it's really difficult to get that to change. Um, within the general public, I really don't know. I I'm hope the book could maybe make a difference, um, but I think I, I was listening to the radio during Emmy CFS day last week, I think it was, yeah, and uh, the radio announcers was talking about this is, this is chronic fatigue day so that I don't know what that means but I think I have it so you know it's <laughs> that still people don't know about the disease so the education really needs to continue more publicity yeah. um what has it been like being involved with that publicity and the fundraising um when you meet other other patients on on awareness days and um when you've been involved with Janet in particular and her advocacy work. Um, what is it like getting involved with it? Well, there's so many amazing people, that, that, especially the people who are sick and, and sacrifice their health to, to do this. Um, that's not, they're my heroes. <laughs> it's just amazing what this community does. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to ask, uh, when you're writing the book, you're writing for such different audiences. We've been talking a lot about the patients you've met, and you know, this book is for Whitney. Um, what was it like trying to create a book that works both for people who have lived this experience, you know, people like me, people like Whitney, and then for people who are new to it necessarily, they don't know a huge amount, and you're trying to combine these things, and you created a book that works for everyone. I wondered how you did that. And um, what you know, what kind of process you went through trying to trying to include these very different perspectives? Well, thank you for saying that because that was a challenge. <laughs> I like like to think it did turn out okay. Um, yeah. So I'm a, I'm trained as a journalist, and I've written a lot about some serious science, and but I write for a general audience. So I am well trained in making things readable, um, but still being accurate about science and getting information out there. Um, <sighs> balancing the, you know, I had an editor who really wanted this to be a bestseller and a page turner. And I had Ron who, really wanted to get as much science in there as we could and to make it as accurate as possible. So I kind of was, that was tricky, but I think we, we worked together hard and I think it, it turned out well. It turned out, it turned out really well. Um, <laughs> everyone, please buy the book and buy it from Lighthouse Bookshop. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, from a UK perspective, I mean, the mentions we get are around uh, British psychiatrists. Um, you mention a couple of reports in particular from the 90s and how damaging they were to America. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, what you found as to the transfer of that of that of those reports and that information and how it affected how it affected patients in the US and, and probably much wider as well. This is something that um, you should ask Ron about as well, because it's very um, important to him. Uh, he's been really upset about um, bad treatments, bad medical treatments, um, prescribing exercise and cognitive behavioral therapy for patients um, when it, particularly the exercise can just make them so much worse. Um, I... Uh, I try and tell the story really from the story that Hillary Johnson tells in her book, Oslo's Web, about I tried to figure out how this happened because early on in the 80s, there were these serious scientists who 
who um, did some good work and really showed that there was this was a biological disease. We needed to study it more. And if they had been listened to early on, we would be so much further. Instead, you know, I do think Stephen Strauss in the book, you can hear his story as a scientist at the NIH who was the spokesperson for this disease to the world, basically. And he he thought it was caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. It's, it's an interesting story. Um, and then when he just proved his own theory uh, from the people I interviewed, it sounded like he just got really frustrated. And if he couldn't solve it, then it must be in your head. And so he switched the focus of uh, what do you tell people that it's a psychological disease and, and, and psychosomatic, um, it's mind-body relationship. And so I didn't, you know, I talked to a few of the research journalists who have um, uh, dealt with the PACE trial. And that's only touched on a little bit, the, uh, the trial that supports the use of exercise therapy um, that's been discredited. It's just fascinating story but it's also just tragic yeah. yeah and full of missed opportunities you know throughout the book where there have been times where it should have been it should have been accepted people should have been able to make progress there has been a lot of a lot of research so that must have been um quite surprising almost i don't know as a science journalist how surprising you found it as you came across more and more um, more and more evidence of, of disease and then mistreatment and mishandling of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's like for you to go in and both shock. It was truly shock and disbelief. And um, yeah, I entered that, interviewed the couple who were sick in Incline Village um, in the 80s and they're still sick now. And it just showed all that needless suffering for decades um, and people have kind of a lot of patients I think maybe withdrawn because they don't see any help out there. Uh, doctors have made things worse for them. Family doesn't believe them. Um, they don't have a voice. So yeah, um, I've forgotten your original question. <laughs> I think despair was probably some of the original question. Um, it is really important to say that it's not um, it's not a despairing book to read. Um, I was having a conversation with Mary at the beginning um, yesterday, and at one point we had to correct ourselves because we referred to it as a fun read. Um, but there is, a, there is a kind of uplifting tone to it, which is amazing considering um, what a, a difficult a difficult story you're writing about. And I, I do want to bring in Ron and Janet soon, but I wondered first if you could give me um, a bit more of an impression of what Whitney is like. You cover a lot of what he's been like throughout his life. You don't just do now, but you also make sure that now gets the significance that it deserves. Um, could you say a little bit about Whitney for, for the audience who haven't yet read the book? And then I think we should be able to bring in Ron and Janet after that. Sure, um, love to talk about Whitney. Um, but first, I did want to say, I think the reason that there's an uplifting tone to the book is because of this family. And, um, you know, I really wanted to understand how people survive and struggle through such difficult times um, it was just, you know, with daily grief. Um, and they just have done it with love and hard work and commitment and finding a cause and finding meaning in all of this and making a difference. Um, and Whitney, I think Whitney in the very beginning was this the spur for this. Um, that surprised me. It took me doing some of my research to realize back before he got too sick, he really became an activist and dove into uh, studying the research and prod it, you know, encouraged his dad to, to redirect his research. Um, oh, Whitney is, he is just so passionate and creative and funny. Um, I, he's, he's my hero. He's a, I don't know how he's survived through the suffering that he's gone through. And, you know, I think there were times where even his family was concerned that it could have affected his brain because he had so little communication for several years there, but he's, his brain is just perfect. And, um, you know, he, he encourages people even when things are so down and difficult for him. Yeah. He's amazing. <laughs> Actually, one last thing. So I, I did. Um, 
I, I don't like to speak publicly, so these are always difficult for me, but I, um, I can now email Whitney, which is amazing. It gets mentioned at the end of the book. So I email him to remind me why I'm doing this. And he said, email back because millions of people are suffering unbelievably beyond anything imaginable every day for decades. And they are almost completely ignored by all aspects of society, medicine, and government. No one sees us, but we are here living our endless numbered days in pain. Thank you, Whitney. <laughs> and I think on um, Whitney's wise words and praise about how amazing he is, we should really bring his parents, his parents in. Hello, um, Ron and Janet. I'm just going to introduce you formally to the audience. Hello. Um, so Ron W. Davis, PhD, has been called one of the wor world's greatest living inventors by The Atlantic. So everyone is starstruck here. Um, he's a professor of biochemistry and genetics at Stanford University and a director of the Stanford Genome Technology Center. He has won numerous awards for his research, including the Gruber Prize in genetics, and he is now devoted to finding a cure for ME-CFF. And Janet Dafo, PhD, received her degree from Stanford University and became a licensed clinical psychologist um, while she was raising two children with her husband, Ron Davis. When her son Whitney Dafo became ill with MECFS, she began to care for him at home. And today she is an advocate and a fundraiser for the MECFS community. Welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to have you. Um, I, wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you, um, first of all, about Whitney's condition at the moment. I know there's been small amounts of progress since the book has been read, although he's extremely severely ill still. Would you mind telling us a little bit about how he is? Let me do that. Okay. He, um, you know, he was completely incommunicado for about eight years. And then um, he started taking Abilify at the end of, uh, this is an antipsychotic medicine. And it, uh, he started that at the end of 2019. And it took him several months, but he started getting a little improvement so that he actually could type and even he couldn't even look at an iPhone before, but he can now type and write his thoughts and work on a little bit of his hobbies in his room by himself. He still can't speak or eat and he still can't tolerate human presence. So he's alone all the time and is very sensitive to sound and uh, to, to human presence. So, uh, we do get to communicate with him a little bit more um, when we're uh, when he goes to the bathroom. Actually, something happens that gives him a little more energy, so we can pantomime with him at that time. But um, uh, most of the time, he's all by himself. And amazingly enough, right now he's uh, doing all this writing, and he's just published a peer-reviewed article about his personal account of having MECFS in the journal Healthcare, which is definitely worth reading. It's very, very amazing that he wrote this. And when he writes, he uses up a lot of his energy and then gets kind of crashes or is really, really tired afterwards. And unfortunately, since ME Awareness Week, um, he, he wrote a lot last week to have posts every day and he's also been working on a letter to President Biden. And uh, he's just kind of gotten worse since last Wednesday. And he's unable to do as much as he was. Um, and we're a little bit worried about, and he's worried about whether he's going to get that capacity back. Um, so it's a little bit sad at, at the moment uh, yeah. to see him um, receding a little bit. Um, but we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully he'll get come back all the way to where he was. Yeah. And I saw a tweet yesterday from him that made me start with laughter about um, a kind of uh, ridiculous uh, concept for a cure. So he's um, definitely worth following on Twitter too. <laughs> doing a little satire on all the advice everybody gets who has CFS, all the things people recommend that you try. Um, and he wrote. He, you want me to say what it was? He, <laughs> yeah, he, wrote, he wrote this tweet saying he's heard the newest advice for CFS is that if you stand on your head with a corn pop up your butt for three days, that you'll get better. And mm -hmm. he 
and really he got so many funny responses on there. It was it's quite hilarious, the whole thread on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, we talked with Tracy a little bit about the team uh, that you've assembled um, of researchers and doctors um, to start working on, CFS, on ME-CFS. Um, we talk a lot about medical neglect and that's a very important part of having this disease, but I also wanted to ask you what it's like working with doctors who are absolutely committed to trying to make them better. And, um, yeah, where where you are with that and what it is like um, to work with these people who are, are really trying to help, as well as obviously his dad is trying to help. Um, so if you could tell me a little bit more about, about that and about his medical care. Talking to Ron now? Uh, both well, of you. Uh, I can give you a little bit, and that is I, I view all these doctors that are trying to help these patients real heroes. Uh, I consider all the patients heroes too. They have put up with this horrible thing uh without being uh recognized for it and with almost no help um so there are a, a large number of heroes out there with this disease uh, we just need a few more uh, we need some people to step up to figure out how to fund the research so we have doctors that are trying to treat the patients we have researchers trying to understand it um, but it's really difficult for both the patient uh, both the doctors the patients and the researchers just not enough resources to actually try to figure this out. Um, uh, for example, I've written you now 17 grants to NIH. Uh, they're not all to NIH. So. I'm sorry. No, they're, uh, <laughs> they're, not, uh, they're not all to NIH. So. They're different institutes. Different 11 to NIH and four to the, yeah, yeah, the yeah, Defense yeah, Department okay, and one yeah. to NSF. Anyway, uh, <laughs> all, but, all but one have been turned down. Um, I understand it's difficult, but what I really get upset with is the reason they turn them down are really, really bad science. So they're basically, uh, I don't know why they do this, um, and why they can't stay in the scientific realm and say honest things. Anyway, that's the spark makes it very difficult. Makes it very difficult for people to try to get into this field. And so uh, there's a lot of frustrations, but we have to do it. And in the book, um, you are described as getting uncharacteristically grumpy at uh, being turned down, uh, having done so many of these throughout your career. Um, yeah. It is very obvious to you that there is not a fair system of appraisal uh, yeah. when you've been putting them forward. Is that right? Uh, that, that's correct. And then also publications get turned down. Uh, in the past, I had, I had a lot of publications turned down. Uh, but what I found out in the end is that the, the more difficult it is to get the paper published, the more times it will be cited. Mm. So the big, and it's because it has a big impact on people uh, and they don't like it. Uh, it. It makes them change their thinking and they don't like it. And that's right. why it's turned down. But then I realized that it is true and it actually changes their mind and it actually makes progress. So, uh, so one thing I want to add to your question is Ron really has um, assembled an incredible team of the top-notch top-notch scientists from all over the world, people that have been his colleagues or people where he goes to meetings and he finds one or two people that are really good at these meetings and asks them to join him and they really respect Ron so they always say yes. So he's gotten Stanford researchers and people um, who are in the National Academy and Nobel Prize winners to be helping him on this. And uh, unfortunately, all of them have the same problem with funding. Um, and they, uh, he's got such an amazing team. If they had a lot of money, they really would be able to tackle this. And that's so disappointing to hear. I think for people with this disease, they would have hoped if a researcher is already very established and already um, very highly regarded, that it would be easier than it is proving to be. No, it's not easier, unfortunately. Uh, our research is actually a little different than in most, especially what, how NIH thinks of it, of generating a hypothesis and collecting some data and publishing a paper and then creating a new hypothesis. Uh, the research is much more in line of trying to figure out what's going on and uh, how can we treat this disease and ultimately how can we cure it. We have to understand everything underlying it to cure it, but we can actually come up with some 
long-term treatments. Uh, we listen to patients uh, in terms of they sometimes tell us that this thing helps them, helps them, and so we look into that, and that's how the Abilify was figured out. Mm -hmm. uh, it yeah. came from the patient. You also have a different attitude to publishing your findings for other scientists. Is that right? Um, well, your open med medicine foundation is, is open. Well, it takes a long time to write a paper and uh, and then submit it. Of course, it's not likely to get rejected. And so then you have to re revise it, put it in someplace else. You consume a lot of time. It usually takes me longer to get it published than it does to do the work. And so uh, we simply post all of our data on a website and people can look at it and people can use it. And uh, that's a little risky, but uh, we did that during the, uh, the genome project. We, po we posted all of our sequence that we collected within 24 hours of collecting it. And it had a much bigger impact on the, on the world because anybody in the world could look at the data. And it's so, very hopeful if this can be happening with NECFS as well, if more people have access. Have you seen evidence of things moving faster or is it still at the at the beginning stages? Well, it's not, fast as, it's not as fast as I would like, but yes, it is moving faster and there are more people getting involved. I put together what I call a working group. And once a year we get together, so now it's a little over a hundred people. Uh, we, we do it on, uh, on Zoom recently because of the pandemic. Um, and that makes it also cheaper, but um, we, we get lots of ideas generated from that and uh, and some people actually start doing experiments or they take the data that we collect and analyze it. There's a lot of data we've collected, so uh, th th there's a big backlog in analyzing all that data. I have to say that given the uh, relatively small amount of funding, uh, Ron has um, been a partner with the Open Medicine Foundation that raises money and um, with the amount of money they've raised, he has made a lot of progress figuring things out. Um, it's just that, you know, I'm here every night. He comes home, he has all these ideas. I, why don't you pursue that? And he's like, I, I don't have the money to pursue it. Why isn't that going faster? We only have one person. It, 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 you know, the whole thing could go faster. But in spite of that, it, he's really, they've come up with some uh, quite a lot of uh, really interesting ideas and progress um on the disease i didn't want to leave that out yeah I, on, the yeah. Ideas, sorry, on the ideas front would you be able to explain the nano needle to us in uh, relatively simple terms but it's one of the more famous things that um has come out of your your personal mecfs research i think a lot of people would like like an explanation of it if you could well the nano needle was developed by a graduate student in from electro engineering i worked with lots of different fields uh, and uh, it measure, it's a very it's a small device. You can't even see it with your eye, um, but it can measure what's called electrical impedance. And we had discovered earlier that if you change something in a cell, uh, you'll change the electrical impedance. So we looked at uh, immune cells in patients, and then we stressed them a little bit to see if their electrical impedance would change. And they do. It changes a lot. Mm -hmm. Healthy people don't. And uh, that's been across the board. Uh, every patient, or way, way over 50 now, uh, show a signal, and 50 healthy controls do not. So it's a, that's a better diagnostic than most diagnostic tests. We haven't seen any false positive or false negatives yet. Um, but we have to re-engineer the whole thing. It's a very complicated device at the present time. We, may, we need to make it simpler. And the uh, engineer has written three grants to make it simpler, and all three have been turned down. Uh, because he, they, they say, you don't understand the biology of the electrical impedance change. No, because he's an electrical engineer, he's not a biologist. <laughs> you need money to do electrical engineering. And this is needed. If we can re redesign it, a lot of people who have access to it, let them figure it out. It's just really, really sloppy thinking on the part of the field. And that's what upsets me. It sounds incredibly frustrating. Um, I wanted to also ask you, Zed, just following straight on from, from what we've been talking about, when you're testing people with ME or, or you're testing Whitney, you're finding an awful lot that is wrong. And you've said the people just aren't looking in the right places. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're finding that's wrong? 
Well, probably one of the important ones is that the mitochondria are not functioning very well. And we still don't know exactly why. Uh, there are some good people who have models for why that is, uh, but we don't know for sure that that's the case. Um, I, I consider this probably what I would call a metabolic disease. That is, there are a lot of small molecules that are made in the body. Uh, a, a large fraction of them are off in concentration in the patients. And that, that will affect uh, your muscles, it will affect your brain, it'll affect some of the organs, it'll affect how your whole body responds to stress and so forth. So uh, that's what we're tracking mostly. Uh, and we certainly have some ideas that what might be causing the problem. The important feature is that once a person gets sick with this disease, they very seldom get over it. So why is that? The body should go back to normal. It doesn't. So why is it locked into this particular state? It's kind of like an alternative state. Mm. And that this is a lot of clues about the, what the biochemistry has to be and the genetics. So that's what we're pursuing mostly is how can you generate this lock-in? And the wonderful thing about this, looking at my son, is if we can unlock it, you'll be normal. <laughs> and uh, there, there isn't, uh, we don't see any obvious uh, damage. There are people who spontaneously get over it. It's rare. But when they do, they're normal. And, and that's a lot of other diseases. And um, is there, are you looking, a lot of people have viral triggers for, for ME-CFS. Are you looking at triggers and how this would be affecting what you're describing is as a metabolic trap. I think I think I'm right in in, um, in saying well, this. Well. The metabolic trap is one of those things which, if you got locked into it, you're stuck. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is how what you want to do is try to prove you're wrong. Mm -hmm. That's how you do research. Uh, you, you don't try to find supporting evidence that you're right. You try to find try to do a, a critical test, um, and it's been difficult to do that. So one thing that we have done is that we have put the genes of human that involve the metabolic trap into yeast and taken out the yeast genes. And so we can now put yeast into a metabolic trap. It's a simple organism. It's easy to work with. We don't have to try something on a human. And we are now setting up to see if we can find a, a, a drug that is approved for use in humans that will get them out of get the yeast out of the trap. And um, yet more long yet more long processes of trying to prove that you're wrong and then also receive more funding um to to, to prove that you're right. right. Um, right. I, yeah. we're going to have to stop for questions relatively soon. I wanted to ask you Janet um about some of your advocacy work and what it's been like uh for the whole family being such prominent um figures uh, with with this disease trying to fund money um trying to raise awareness of what it is like um whilst Whitney is incredibly severely ill um what has it been like for you as a family and what has it been like for Whitney to have that extra happening well first of all Whitney was always a very private person mm -hmm. and when Ashley decided to try to raise money for this and uh, get involved uh, we all realized that he would be the perfect poster boy because of his dad and him and the combination. And so she talked him into doing that. And he was a little reluctant at first, but now he's just jumped all the way in and he's just sucking up his desire to be private and putting himself out there uh, to, to um, especially to give people hope and to try to prevent the suicides that happen when people are desperate. He says, you know, if I can do this, you can too. And I will take on your pain, give it to me. And he's just amazing at, at putting himself out there. And then I, uh, we have become very public figures, which is just not something <laughs> that we ever expected in life. It's very weird and, uh, it's hard to explain, but but I'm also just embracing it as much as I can because if I can make a difference, I want to make a difference. I mean, I really believe if something's put in front of you that you can do something about, you need to pick it up. And we've just picked it up and we're doing everything we can. And really, it's been an amazing experience. Um, 
first of all, I basically lost most of my past life. I, I had to stop my career. A lot of our friends have sort of uh, faded away or whatever. Um, it's like being in a different world. And in its place is this world of uh, all these amazing MECFS patients and caregivers all over the world. And I've made some incredible friends and I try to go on and help people and talk to people. Uh, like if they're getting a J-tube, I'll just call them up and help them, tell them our experience, not as a doctor, but you know, the inside experience of what it's like to have a J-tube or a pick line. And I just do as much as I can to help patients and be there or also help advocate. Like if somebody, a couple of people have been threatened with being put in a psych ward against their will and I help them get the right literature or talk to their doctors or their psychologists. And I've just gotten really involved and I can hardly wait when this, when everybody gets better to <laughs> go around the world and meet all these people because I, that's a really a group of very special, amazing people who have MECFS and they've lost so much. Um, it's, it's very inspiring and I'm really happy to do what I can to help. There aren't enough people helping. And there's uh, such a lot of hope. Um, please, please speak, Ron. Well, it just, it's very much like the, maybe the mentality of, of having a war. You definitely don't want to be involved in the war. It's just something you have to do in spite of the fact you don't want to do it. I'd much rather be in the lab inventing something, but uh, I have to be, uh, it's important to put out the communication. It's important to interact with people. I'm not good at it, but uh, it's what I have to do. I have to try at least. And uh, that's, it's, all, it's, all, it's not a matter of do I want to do it. It's, I have to do it. Well, he's a perfect scientist to take it on, I must say. The science, <laughs> it's really, it's really good for MECFS that yeah. Ron's involved with it. He's, it's like his whole life and scientific career and training has set him up to be figuring this out. And it so, feels so very. I, I don't think in words uh, very much. Uh, I mm -hmm. think in images and uh, and putting things together. So pathways and how things go and pathways and flows and all that. Uh, that's how I think. So uh, it, it makes it perfect for trying to figure this sort of thing out. But that's probably what's going on. Something is blocking a flow of something. Where is it? Another thing I do is uh, patients have so many ideas. They've researched all over the place. They know their own bodies. They have lots and lots of information. And I am, am one of the conduits of that information to Ron. He gets lots of ideas um, from the patients and they flow through me because he's, it's, his email is impossible to deal with. So, <laughs> so that's another thing I do is get information from the patients to Ron. And Ron, you mentioned not thinking in words and Tracy talked early on about your um, childhood, very poor health. Um, that must have given you a very, um, as, a, as an insight into what your son is going through, it must yeah. have been very clear for you, for you to, you know, to grasp very quickly um, what is happening with him and, and the difference, difference in the way that his brain is working and, and how ill he is. Yeah, I, 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 I'm estimating that I had about 200 strep infections and where I would get about 104 fever and I would be uh, in bed for quite a long time. Mm. In the early stages of that is there was no antibiotics. Uh, all the antibiotics were being used in World War II. So uh, I just had to tough it out. For 12 years, yeah. early stages. Yeah. For 12 years. So um, I could just lie in bed and uh, imagine things. Mm. And I would take my brain to someplace else. And most of that was perceptions. And I realized I could learn to think in color and three dimensions and uh, that's probably where some of that uh, brain training actually helped me, but it was a very young age. And I think you probably can wire your brain differently when, when you're young. But it sure didn't help in high school. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about high school. I think we're all incredibly grateful for the, the way that your brain works now. Um, and 
I think um, getting such a tone of hope from you both this evening um, is, I hope that's an accurate um, perception of how you're feeling, um, but that is a really nice thing for, for sufferers um, to hear. We are going to take a very short break. We're going to take three minutes, everyone. So please um, get a cup of tea, go to the toilet, um, ask more questions. Everyone, please ask questions and we will see you in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. You can go first. I uh, we're just slowly getting set back up. Uh, I hope you had a nice wee break. Um, do put all your questions out there for us, whatever they may be. Um, we have uh, three terrific minds uh, and hearts on uh, many difficult questions. Um, so don't be shy, put them in the wee chat. And then I'm going to start, I'm just going to go through cameras so we'll have little faces pop up. Here we go. And then Tracy. And then Erin. There we go. And have we got everyone's mics back on? There we go. Welcome back. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, um, we'll be in a few minutes. Terrific. We've got time. Um, I'm just going to uh, again say a huge thank you to all of you for being part of this conversation. Um, and a huge thanks to Tracy for putting this story out there in such an accessible way. And as someone has written, this book is incredible. It's a great read. Tracy, you said your publisher wanted a real page turner. You delivered. Um, and this is, it's such a big part of getting the message out there. Um, and of course, the other side of it is what you and Janet are doing, Ron. So from the bottom of my heart, huge thank you. Um, everyone, we are donating from proceeds from the book to the Open Medicine Foundation. Uh, so do buy the book, uh, send it to your MP, uh, send it to your local GP. Um, if you can't afford the book, we've had copies donated and we always have money in the pay it forward. So whether it's for this book or another, if you're broke, uh, you can always get a book from Lighthouse. Uh, just shoot us an email and we will sort that out for you. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, make my little head small again and uh, hand over to Erin uh, to take your questions. So we have, oh, we have lots of questions. Um, let's start, at, okay, we have a long COVID question. This will probably be for Ron. Will research into long COVID help support ME research and lead to new discoveries and better funding? Uh, Ron, would you, would you like me? Yeah, I hope that uh, the long COVID experiences will help. Uh, it, it would appear that the scientific community and the public uh, accept the fact that long COVID exists uh, and the uh, long COVID patients that seem to be so disparaged and said it's all in their head. Um, uh, so I'm hoping that's the case. And a perfect illustration is that NIH has put up uh, around $17 million a year for MECFS research. But then when the loan COVID came out, they put up $1.15 billion. Uh, it's about the same number of patients with the same symptoms. And the worry I have, of course, is the fact that uh, it will attract, because it's a lot of money, a lot of people that know nothing about MECFS and they will start from scratch and uh, we will get nowhere for quite a long time until they begin to realize that uh, we should join forces. I'm, I would hope that uh, some of that money for long haulers could be used for MACFS research because it's so similar. I've written one grant which was turned down to do that. Uh, uh, and, and I've written, uh, written another one that's not reviewed yet. So right, now, right now it looks like they're giving a lot of that money to, to, you know, people studying lungs and different organs. It's not clear if, at the moment, NINDS, which is the neurological disease is part of NIH, it hasn't gotten any of the money. So it's uh, concerning. Mm -hmm. Similar stories of research being turned down, the idea of looking in the wrong places and um, again, missing missing money for MECFS. Um, is on the long COVID question also being able to study if it's if there's a viral cause do you think being able to study people with long COVID who develop some symptoms very similar to MECFS do you think it will help to know the very beginning origins of their illness um with with COVID well yeah I absolutely I think it is because uh for MECFS it usually takes the patients uh years to get diagnosed so most of the people we're studying have had this disease for three, four years, five years. Uh, so you're seeing them in a much later stage. Uh, it may be different at the beginning. Mm. Uh, so that's been a, why I wrote some grants in the very early stages of this. We want to be able to get some data from uh, patients that have just gotten over the virus. I'd like to take samples when they still have the virus. Because when, when does that conversion happen? It may mm. happen the infection so uh, but that's tough because you have to put the, you have to work in very high containment to do that yeah. but I would still like to have it as soon as they're virus free uh, and we do have a collaborator uh, in Sweden who's able to collect a lot of samples he has funding to do that uh, he's been sending uh, 
some of those samples first to Harvard and then they'll send them to us. So some of those are early collected samples. Uh, so we're, I'm hoping we can preserve uh, some early studies. It's a little difficult because you're following up on the patients is always difficult when, when it's international. Uh, so a lot of our patients that we study are local. So we can actually go back to them and, and do things like look at, look at the function of time, how they've changed. Another problem is that uh, long COVID patients often have damage to an organ, especially the lungs, but it could be other organs. And a lot of doctors are saying this isn't ME-CFS, this is lung damage or whatever. And they really need to understand that you could have damage to an organ and have ME-CFS. And they need to look at the whole picture, um, which a lot of people are dismissing the possible ME-CFS part of it. So we're hoping that that isn't the, what the story that ends up staying that way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've talked to so many doctors who told me that you never have two diseases at the same time. It's only one. So if it's damaged, then that's it. So it, that I, is also a, has a, been yeah. also some awareness that this could be ME-CFS that some of these patients are, I think Dr. Fauci said something about that. So it's at least part of the conversation. Yeah. yeah, yes it is. And it may break down some of those barriers. There is also, there's a question that leads quite nicely from um, the idea of whether um, ME is one condition. Um, do you think it is more likely that ME is one condition or that it will turn out to be an umbrella of conditions that could require different diagnostic tests and treatment? That is from MG, who is asking that. Uh, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, you have to be in mind, it could be either. Uh, we have uh, a, a condition called CCI. Um, uh, uh, Cranial cervical instability. <laughs> and that causes the same symptoms. Um, and so that could be a different uh, cause. Or, and in fact, it could be that the cause of uh, uh, the metabolic cause of the disease affects the same part of the brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we just have to have an open mind about what's going on. There's also a case of uh, what's the trigger and the cause, fundamental cause, and then what are causing symptoms, and they may also be different. And you may be able to treat some of the symptoms, but you don't get rid of the original cause. And well, I'll take both of those. I want to help the patients. Um, also from MJ, she says, my mum and a carer is asking if you have a gut feeling about how long it will take to develop treatment and how quickly it can be mass produced once one is found? That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, that's a, uh, we, we can't not predict that, except the, the fact that that's what we're working on hard. So the fact that uh, the discovery that Abilify seems to really be working, uh, mm -hmm. it's not a double blind study, so it, it won't necessarily be accepted by lots of physicians. Uh, the difficulty is it will cost us about $3 million to do a, a, a legitimate double-blind study. Um, we have most of the p uh, people we can put into place to do that at Stanford. Um, there is a Stanford clinic that does MECFS, uh, but that we don't have the money. And so that would be a good thing to do. We have some... Uh, <coughs> It appears that uh, what may be happening is that the Abilify affects dopamine. And, uh, and, and it's the dopamine effect that may be helping them. So we've been looking very deeply at how dopamine is synthesized and coming up with other ideas that might cause dopamine to not be produced very much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we're heavily looking at what else we could do that might help the patients in that whole pathway. And Abilify, Janet, is an example of um, a patient a patient idea uh, rather than double blind tested research. Um, right. That's coming from the patient community. Well, a patient who was taking it for another reason and noticed that their CFS, ME-CFS symptoms improved and told the doctor and then Dr. Bonilla started prescribing it to other people in low doses and found that it was helping. So uh, another example of that is of Copaxon, which a patient, uh, it's treat treatment for MS, who was diagnosed with MS and was taking Copaxon and she got a lot better. 
And then she discovered she didn't have MS, she had MECFS instead. Well, it still helped. And then she became allergic to it and had to stop taking it. So she brought us her leftover Copaxone, which we've been now looking at. Uh, that's another thing, uh, again, came coming from a patient. So we're now able to synthesize our, our, our cells, our synthesized Copaxone. So we're gonna make some modifications to the Copaxone to maybe, uh, so that it won't be, uh, beca you won't become allergic to it. So the question is how long is all this gonna take? And unfortunately in science, it's just impossible to predict. And especially in this kind of science where Ron is always having to invent the technologies to measure things. It's not, it's not using existing technologies. He has to create the technologies and there's always bumps in the road and, and you know, things that happen that are unpredictable problems he has to solve. And I know people want to know when, but it's just impossible to answer. And believe me, we're just as frustrated by that as everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> so most scientists will measure things, but you can commercially get the equipment to do it. Uh, we don't think that way. We think, what is it that we have to measure? And there's so many times we come up with something that we really need to measure and there's no way to do it. Okay, fine. Let's figure out how to do it. And that unfortunately takes time and also money. But we're really good at doing that. Uh, we've done it over and over again. So, but it does, unfortunately, it does take time. I th should say one thing is that when we're focused on trying to do the treatment or a cure, we want to look at uh, the FDA approved drugs. There's a large number of them. We have all of them in our freezer at, at our lab, uh, because if we can find one of those that will work or combinations of those that will work, then it, it, it's likely to go very quickly. And uh, if we have to develop a new drug, we're talking 10 or 20 years. I don't want to do that. I don't mind pharmaceutical companies doing that, but I don't want to be involved in it. Uh, and you, they might make something that's a lot better than what we find. But if I can make the patients better with existing, and we're also looking at herbal extracts. So I have contacts now in India and, and China, because they do a lot of this, where they can provide us with a large number of those extracts. Some of my students work, I've gone back to those countries. I think a lot of people will probably, next question will be, which kind of herbs, if it's herbal extracts? I'm sorry, what? What which herbal kind of herbs? Talking about. Oh, oh, everything I get my hands on. Uh, we, we automate everything, so we can, we'll can we automate all the, uh, all the screens. We just have to have the materials. And I don't mind even uh, exporting it. We can develop an assay that somebody in India can run with, with a whole bunch of, of materials. That would be fine. Can you say what any of them are at the moment? No. Uh, I, okay. We have. We, th this is this is doing it randomly, right? So I'm, there's no particular herbal extract that I think might work. It's a matter that we, we don't know. Uh, the herbal extracts have complex molecules in them. Most of them are called natural products, uh, but they often have high affinities uh, to things, and they can change the behavior. So um, it's a matter of just screen. And now he's got this yeast model that enables him to screen, at least for the metabolic trap. And if we don't find a, a product in the, the FDA approved drugs, then we'll, we'll push ourselves into the natural products. And we've okay. also got technologies in yeast where we can actually make these things in yeast. I'm going to try and get through as many of these questions as we have. We have nine questions still. Um, on that no, actually, um, hi Ron and Janet. Thanks for being for being here. Your whole family is so inspiring. This is from Audrey. I have a blue skies question. If you had all the funding you could get, what would be the first big experiment you would do to really figure out what is going on in MECFS? Thank you, Audrey, for that question. It's for Ron and Janet again. That is a good question, but I usually don't think that way. Uh, the most important experiment we would then be doing right now, we are doing right now. The problem is that those may not be the right answer. So what I would do with more money is I would try to recruit uh, a very diverse group of, of researchers. That works extremely well uh, because then you can cover all your bases. I would try to get uh, computer scientists, engineers, um, 
biochemist, uh, geneticist, all these people, and M MDs to make sure that we are understanding medicine well. I would put together a team of people from across disciplines, which you don't find in an academic department. You know, the biochemistry department has biochemists. Genetics department has geneticists. The electroengineering has electroengineers. They don't talk to one another, and I, except occasionally. I would put them all together. And including mold specialists, just for yeah, those yeah. The molds <laughs> out there. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> the molds are actually quite interesting. Some people think they are, they are the case, uh, but I just don't happen to have a person that is extremely good at mold. And, uh, and we don't have the technology for measuring some of the, the molds make a lot of toxic products. And, uh, but they're very, very toxic and not in high concentration. So it, measuring them is hard. Um, the next question, as, I mean, this is a, um, following on from all the different departments that, um, that you want to work with. As the brain possibly plays a central role in MECFS, will you make an effort to recruit any of the top brain researchers in the world to help study the disease? That's from Dave. Um, so again, just about which type of researchers um, are, are, trying to, are trying to figure out, figure out this disease and answer these questions. Well, uh, I'm not sure the, the way the, the brain researchers are moving at the present time is going to be that helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I, I, I suspect if it is involved, it's something at the level of the uh, biochemistry. And uh, uh, what a lot of them do is imaging, and some of that imaging technology is pretty impressive. And uh, I may change my mind. Uh, there are some people now doing a lot more imaging. If you can image and actually uh, detect molecules, then I'm all on, uh, then I'm on board. Mm -hmm. But if it's a matter of seeing images and saying, you know, what's going on, uh, we see dark and dark and white spots. Uh, that isn't uh, that is not related to chemistry, and the problem has to be probably chemistry if we're going to solve it, because mm -hmm. to solve it, you use a drug. A drug is a chemical. Uh, one question that leads on nicely from that, has the testing of FDA approved drugs begun in yeast cells that have the metabolic trap induced? That question comes from Amy. Uh, yeah, we haven't started that screen yet because our robots aren't working. Uh, they're very <laughs> old and they have broken down and we've got to repair them. And, you have uh, old robots. <laughs> and then that's the problem we have. Uh, our centrifuge is no longer working. We finally got some money to buy a new centrifuge. Uh, our high pressure liquid chromatography system was wearing out. Uh, we fixed it many, many times, but now we can't get parts. So we got a donation to replace it. Uh, that's what the research is like. Uh, I, I feel like I'm uh, uh, George Washington fighting the Revolutionary War. Sorry about that from, from the people in England. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, he had a ragtag army in a sense that, you know, the, uh, we don't have enough food to feed the, the, the soldiers, our powder is wet, you know, problem after problem after problem. But that we're going to win. But he won. <laughs> <laughs> and because persistence. Right? So I've had questions of how much money do you need for those robots yeah, yeah. when you said that last, you know, yeah, previous. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I have to figure this stuff out. Uh, I don't know that we necessarily want to buy a new one because then we have to worry about getting it all set up. Um, and it might be easier to fix the old one first. But anyway, those are the kind of problems that we have. Um, mm. We try to do a lot of things with robotics and that, that, that can speed things up a lot if, it, if we get them to work. Um, we have a question for Tracy here. We've just had another year of ME awareness. Tracy, how do we reach the media better to alter this terrible distortion of this illness? That's a very good question. Um, I, the advocacy work does make a difference. So getting out there and talking to politicians is really important. Um, I, I'm... Um, doing some writing for work about uh, long COVID. I think that might be a way to get, uh, there's a lot of stories about long COVID and that might be a way to get more attention to MECFS as well. Um, sharing the book hopefully will help. 
Um, we have another long COVID question here. Is there a way for your research to be carried into the studies of long COVID or does it just depend on the other researchers wanting to use it? You've talked about this a lot, um, a little bit already. You could um, expand a wee bit more, Ron, on that question for MJ. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, getting uh, the, the federal agencies to recognize that as well and be willing to to put some money into it. Um, there's been requests for uh, take, considering that, um, but it's really tough because there seems to be so much prejudice in reviewers against MECFS, but not long COVID. And so right. they may want to keep them separate and saying, oh, it's probably a different thing. Uh, long COVID is real and MECFS is not real. But we're hoping that that isn't happening everywhere. No. There is a big push to pull them together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I asked Tracy earlier in the conversation if she felt like attitudes to MECFS had changed. Um, this doesn't sound particularly like they've changed very much um, from your from your perspective. No, they have changed a lot. It's just okay. not enough. Not enough. Um, I have a... An... They haven't changed. It's just ra random doctors around the country and patients still have lots and lots of experiences of going to doctors and not being able to get what they need, even though they can go in and say exactly what's going on and what they need. The doctors don't listen to them and they don't want to think that the patient knows more than they do, or the doctor thinks that it's in their head or they need antidepressants or, or they're anorexic or whatever. And it's very, um, I mean, I just see this all the time in my, uh, in my social media people saying they went to a doctor and had X, Y, Z horrific experience of not being listened to and not getting what they need. So that is a huge thing. And I know that uh, there is a, a, U, a United States clinician coalition that has this, all the best experts in MECFS in the United States that have met once a year and they have put out um, handouts and they have a website if you check U.S. Clinician Coalition, you'll find their information and it's things that they can all agree on and give that to your doctors. Um, and uh, Mary Dimick is working on getting some of that published. So we'll have even more credibility and that will help with awareness and knowledge. And following on from that, we have a, a comment from Jennifer who says, I have MECFS and I'm overwhelmed by a hurricane of feelings anger, gratitude, and even hope. I can't quite get a question together, but I want to say thank you to Tracy, Janet, and Ron. So just following on from, um, from what we've been saying, it's um, Jennifer's comment. Thank you. We wish you the best. And I think everybody, everybody on the call and everybody with any experience of this disease would like to thank all three of you. Um, it's it's an amazing it's an amazing story and and um, journey that you're that you're on and we're just so delighted um, that that Ron in particular is doing it. It's amazing. Another question for Ron: Are there other mitochondrial diseases that are similar to ME that could be studied alongside ME so that we might be able to access some money that's designated for those diseases? That's from Tricia. I'm not aware of that. I think this is a metabolic problem, not necessarily. Uh, uh, indirectly caused by something that is not necessarily mitochondrial in itself. Mitochondria make an awful, or directly or indirectly, an awful lot of the metabolites uh, because that's where the source of energy comes from. It's like the big manufacturing plant. But uh, most of the genetic, most of the work is done on genetic uh, mitochondrial defects. And, and I, I'm not sure that that's actually going to help us very much. So it's in in the rough region, but not the right subject for mitochondrial disease. We, we have an idea now what the molecule might be that's inhibiting it. Uh, and now it's a matter of going in and actually doing uh, testing to see if that is right. So we'll take it from cultures, blood from people, healthy people, and see if we can shut down their mitochondria. Um, we have one more uh, question on, on a particular uh, particular um, illness mechanism. Some people think that there is some sort of adrenal failure. Is this something that you have studied? That comes from Mary Campbell. Thank you for your question, Mary. Um, adrenal failure, is this something that you've studied? Uh, 
No, we haven't worked directly on adrenal failure, but we do work with the molecules that are involved. Uh, and uh, again, I, te- I do this from a chemistry point of view, not a structural point of view. And uh, to some extent, I don't necessarily care where it's made. I just want to know what the chemistry is. And yes, we have some indications of what might be going on with adrenals. It's secondary, it's not primary. Right. I, I want to keep tracking this back to the beginning of where it starts, not where it ends up. Everybody looking at where it ends up. Mm. Some secondary things could be treated as with respect to mm. treating a symptom, but that isn't necessarily the cause of the disease is what he's right. saying. Yeah. So the doctors are good about those kind of things. Some treating doctors. this or some of them are, yes. <laughs> some of them are really good at that. Uh, but I want to track it back to you know, if I see something that's being made that is unusual, how is that being made? Hmm. What makes that? And then if I find that, and then I say, well, what makes that? Right, so it's unfortunately a, a long-term going back to trying to figure out where the thing is. And we also have to look at why you can get stuck. Hmm. So if, uh, when we get to something where, hey, you could get stuck this way, then those what we focus on, because we want to unstick it. Chemically, then that's the cure. So, uh, an illness origin story from from Ron is what, is what we're after. Um, I have one question, an anonymous question: Is Whitney's progress recently ascribable to any particular treatment, or is it too difficult to tell what has made a difference to his energy levels? And then, in brackets, we saw a huge difference from mestanone. Um, so, Whitney's progress and um, possibly a comment on mestanone. Well, we've, he's taken Mestinon and it didn't help him particularly, um, but his recent progress is most almost definitely due to taking Abilify. And it's, if you try that, I just want, I'm not a doctor, but it's a very low dose. He started at 0.25 milligrams and increased it by that much once a week or less often until he got to two milligrams. And then it took him a month or two to even notice any difference. Mm. Um, and that's what this his improvement is. That's the only thing that's changed. And if you go above two milligrams, you're likely to see side effects, and sometimes there can be pretty bad side effects. Yeah. So, if for any reason get a, get side effects, then reduce the dose. Uh, because some to wait for progress as well, two months. A day. If you do get side effects, you can just reduce the dose. Sometimes the side effects go away, and the benefits stay. Um, you can experiment with going higher than two milligrams, but um, uh, it, it, you just increase the chances of side effects and go back down again if you get those. And that's all information that I've gotten from Dr. Bonilla. And I'm not a doctor, so do this under supervision of a doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, please do things under supervision. Um, we have one last question. Uh, this is from Amy again. Would it help for donations to be made to the OMF and specified for repair of the robots? Thank you. That's her question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. That's a brilliant question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you can go to the Open Medicine Foundation and donate, or you can go directly to our lab uh, you know, at Stanford and uh, specify the Stanford Medical Center and then specifically specify me. Um, and the only reason to do that is that it's a little faster. So okay, she's so saying, would it help to specify at OMF yeah. that it's for repairing robots? Uh, well, no, because not, not necessarily. Um, because uh, if it's specified for that, then we have to use it for that. And uh, if we get the robots working, we may not want to use the money there. We want, you know, so many things we need. We need a new microscope, for example. You know, there's just so many things that uh, were state of the art uh, ten years ago, but they're no longer state of the art. So, so the robots may have to carry on into their old age a wee bit more. Uh, right. <laughs> well, they're working on fixing them. Yeah, we're working on fixing them. I have a really, I've had some, I have some really outstanding people that have been with me a long time, and uh, what I have done is to learn what their skills are, and then I have them do that. And it, it, it's usually fun for them to do the follow their skills, uh, and and they enjoy doing it. And so they stay. I've, I've suggested sometimes some of them go do something different, and they say, "Well, 
if you really want me to do that, then I'm going to quit if you do, because <laughs> I really like doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that, because they're really, really good at what they are good at doing. Really good. Um, so for people to donate to these people who are wanting to carry on being good at what they're doing, there are some there are already some links um, in the chat on the side. That's us. I mean, we're out of time, very out of time, uh, and um, finally got through everyone's questions. So thank you so much for the questions that everyone asked. And thank you so much for answering them. Um, please, everybody, buy this book. Buy it from Lighthouse Books. Um, donate to the OMF. Um, please help, help Ron carry on doing such brilliant work. Um, thank you so much, Tracy, Ron and Janet for being here. Um, we're so very grateful to you uh, for speaking to us and for everything you do. Um, yes, thank everyone, thank you so thank much. You for, coming. Thank um, you so much for yeah. having us and yeah. I look forward to seeing you in Scotland when, yeah. when we've got this <laughs> figured out. Yes, please come. We will we will make you very welcome in our, our tiny bookshop um, compared to American bookshop sizes. Um, I'm going to myself in that Scottish accent. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone who's been watching and who's made it to the end. Um, sending sending best wishes to everyone's health. Please, the people in the UK, go to sleep really soon. Um, the people in the US, please carry on having a good day. Um, that's going to be bye from us for now. Um,